remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. There are certain people in our community who are treasures, who are jewels, um, who are part of us by root, by branch, by fruit, um, that we would just not be the same without. They um, have defined us, they are of us, and are inseparable um, based on history. We just know that separating us means our demise and their demise. And uh, we are very honored to have one of those jewels with us today. Um, our sister is someone who has been expressing our value, critiquing our weaknesses, uh, seeing through our facades, capturing the best, and exposing the worst through her artistic eye and voice. So we, as always, are very honored to have Sister Laini Mataka with us today, particularly because she has felt so inspired to take a moment to pay tribute to our brothers. And uh, we are very happy that this is the spot that she chose. And with no further ado, please help me welcome Queen Laini Mataka. tribute for black men, but I wanted something grand, you know. I, want, I didn't want that. I wanted a rent a room full of people and all kinds of uh, activities and everything. And since I had like about five dollars, <laughs> that was not happening. And I said, okay, if we don't have any money and we can't do the great, great, great big thing, what can we do? So I said, okay, maybe I can just do a small tribute, a private tribute to black men myself. And one of the reasons why I'm feeling the need to do this so much is because I walk a lot. And um, sometimes I might walk from like uh, Walter Reed Hospital down to like Florida and uh, 14th or Florida and Georgia. And as I come down the street, I see groups of black men outside every day on a corner on some steps in front of a store they look like clumps of grapes rotten on a vine okay they don't have anything to do they don't have anywhere to go and if i come back a couple hours later they're going to be right where i left them okay it gets tiresome seeing that right and the other part is that so many people that we love have been dying, okay? And that last two, that Gil Scott and Geronimo Pratt, I mean, that knocked both legs from under me, both legs. So I was thinking, okay, what can I do? What can I do, what can I do? I have been wanting to write Gil a poem like forever, but it's not always easy to condense a person into a poem. Some people are so big, the things they've done are just so massive that you can't just do it like that. So. What's going to happen is that I will probably write several poems about him, just as I've had to write several poems about Malcolm. So this tribute basically is for the brothers that collect the garbage, the brothers that pick dirt up and trash up off the street, uh, the brothers that clean windows, you know, the brothers who are outside of the markets asking can they help somebody carry their groceries, all right? The brothers who are sleeping in bus stops and the little kiosk and stuff. It's for black men that we do not want to look at too closely, too often, or too much. So I'm gonna start out with reading out of Being a Strong Black Woman Can Get You Killed. And I promised myself today that I was not doing any negative poems about black men. This is called Shoe Shine Man, the importance of which is that black men have 
been self-reliant or trying to be self-reliant for so long in so many different ways, okay, that <clears throat> they worked jobs that they hated or jobs that didn't offer much dignity or jobs that didn't have much honor attached to them so that they could take care of their families and send their children into um, what they called a better life. Okay, which was not always better to have more material goods. So this is Shoe Shine Man, and I actually wrote this for this for this man who has the uh, a shoe shop at 14th Street and V. Okay, he is 89 years old and is still working yeah. every day, all day long. Okay, and when he walks down the street, he's so brisk with it. You know, and he does not understand black men not having jobs, okay? <laughs> Mr. Duke, an anachronism. How dare you do that which embarrasses us by reminding us of jigaboo days long gone, except in the White House. The rhythms you cultivate catch us stiff-legged, refusing to remember the times that made us bleed yet saved our lives. Master of self-reliance, alternative lifestyle maker, with a box and some rags, you strive to make that which lacks luster shine. Some still think that your head down means that they can lift theirs a little bit higher. What they and others fail to know is that after all the spitting and waxing and spitting and waxing and spitting and waxing and bumping and glowing, it is your reflection that is perfected. You ever notice that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Jimmy Gray. Jimmy Gray was a black entrepreneur. He also had a radio program, and he used to say some very, very clever things like resist ignorance, especially your own, okay? <laughs> he also uh, created Black Fire, which was a recording company, and he had some very high quality um, brothers signed up with him. The importance of Jimmy Gray is that he said he didn't wait around and say, well, why don't we do this or why don't we do this? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And he showed us how to do it. It's important to do things even on a small level. Everything can be grandiose all the time. We can't start at the absolute top all the time. Do the small things that you can do successfully, and then we can build up to greater things. Did Jimmy know music? Jimmy knew music like Langston knew Rivers, like Africans knew Hambone, like Sitting Bull knew Victory, like David Walker knew Coochie Chagalier, like James Cameron knew Bitching, like Bessie knew the blues. Jimmy knew music like Cab knew Clean, like Ethel knew Waters, like Castro knew, Ch knew Change, like the Nicholas Brothers knew Dance, like the Zoot Suit knew Cool, like Jack Johnson knew the old one too, like Garvey knew the UNIA. Jimmy knew music like Claude McCain knew Fighting Back, like Diz knew Bebop, like Monk knew Ebony Ivory, like Zora knew Mules and Men, like Fanny knew New Pain, like Elijah knew Blue Eyed Devils, like Aretha knew Respect. Jimmy knew music like Ben Serdeman knows Mexico, like Dr. Ben knows Egypt, like Michael Jordan knows basketball, like Oprah knows money, like Mary Barry knows Entrapment, like Pacifica knows music. Jimmy knew music like Langston knew ancient dusky rivers, and like Langston, his soul has grown deep like the music, the music, the music, the right come. <laughs> Switching into, I'm been, I've been using a computer so much that I'm kind of embarrassed. I didn't realize that I wasn't reading my own handwriting anymore. Isn't that terrible? Because I'm so used to printing everything up now. So I actually, since I'm, my printer was broke, so I had to write some things down. That was an experience. <laughs> this poem is called Peekaboo. How do women play into allowing black men to be black men? This is called Peekaboo. What of the men who do walk straight? How many erections can respect subdue? When skirts fly by so short, you can almost see the honey dripping. supposed to do? You know what I mean? When women carry themselves like that, what are men supposed to do? Pluck their eyeballs out? Okay. For our man who left us so recently, I knew him, I knew him through the arts. I knew him as a, a professional, no, another professional. Gil, and I'm proud to say that one day he actually kissed me on my forehead. <laughs> Gil was not one of the last poets, but he was one of the last poets to party with a conscience straight out of one century and right into another. 
When incidents of major significance occurred, we turned to him, fully expecting him to transcribe those events into something that we could dance to, hug up on, or just feel. He cried, what's the word? And we stormed the gates of resistance, smelling the nearness of freedom. We loved him up and begged for more, even when we saw his sun eclipse and light leaking from a hole in his soul. We remained focused on our tremendous need for him instead of his tremendous need for something greater than all of us. And now that he's got a gig in the upper rooms, what can we do but canonize him? After all, he certainly paid the price of sainthood. From Never as Strangers, for George Jackson. When I read um, Blood in My Eye, and what was the other one? Soledad Brother, Soledad Brother. Um, I had had men in my family in prison like all my life. You know, there was always some man in my life that, you know, in my family that was in prison. But I didn't understand what that meant until I started reading George Jackson's work, okay? And after I started reading his work, I started volunteering in the prisons, you know, just paying attention to that when I hadn't done so before, okay? Um, usually, you don't pay any attention to people in prison unless they're your family members or your friends. Otherwise, you think they're just people who did something wrong and deserve to go to jail, okay? Not true. For George, this poem does not commemorate ghosts. Ghost being a white man's conception of a universal entity, this poem will key the unlocked spirit of George Jackson, Jonathan being a whole other testament. This poem is a demonstration designed to re-expose the primitiveness of white people who still don't know that it's time to come out of that caveman shit. They laid for him. They forced him to play the victim for the last time. And even after they filled his body with lead and they were sure that he was dead, 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 they handcuffed him. Afraid even of his spirit that he might fly up out of his body and avenge it. They tried to capture his soul in death since they were never able to do it in life. And they left his body baking away in the sun for six hours to be sure that he was no longer a threat. But little did they know that his people had feasted on his dreams and drank deep the blood in his eye to later go out into the night looking for something white to sacrifice. And since he made me think about jail so much, I did a, a little series of very small poems called The Joint. Courtside is, you get locked up, if you don't have money for, for bail, then they send you what is known as courtside, which is still jail, okay? But you're going there before you even get to your, your actual trial, all right? So, courtside. Because there is no reason to rise, New days are raped of their potential and left dying like crust on some waking, though non-seeing eye. Steel and concrete do not inspire growth in any living thing. Within their confines, flowers die and black men wither. On the other side of prison walls, my heart splinters into a thousand sunless cells. The man of my dreams wears a montage of convict faces, and these hours spent in yearning form bars just as hard as the ones that imprison my lover's face. One out of every third black man between the ages of 18 and 36 is in prison. Okay? That's enslavement. Okay? And it's legal. Right? So what do we have to do? We have to come up with other routes to keep our children from going to prison. In a third grade class in Brooklyn, they asked the children to draw pictures of where people go after they leave school, okay? And a little boy built a tunnel, he, he, he drew a tunnel that led straight to prison. Because he thought automatically, you, you know, you, you go to school and then you go to prison because you don't finish school, so you automatically go to jail. So, so what's been going on is the powers that be are going into third grade classes, uh, taking a look at the grades of young black boys and deciding how many prisons to build on the basis of their grades in the third grade. This is ominous and it's diabolical. Okay? Black men do not belong in jail. Somebody's always talking about black men. And usually it's somebody that doesn't love them, all right? 
And most of what they say is true, but it's not true about all black men. This is a praise song. I'm a little Billy Harper if you want to, but up and out of my heart, which ain't no easy place, I give thanks for the births of all the black, brown, and beige brothers who struggled to get out of that birth canal and have since never tried to re-enter. Give thanks to all the brothers who know and have always known the value of family as opposed to dropping seeds in every reachable field of glory. Give thanks to all the brothers who accompany their women into the delivery rooms to witness and participate in the positive welcoming of their newborn into this world. Give thanks to brothers who actively join in controlling births and preventing diseases. Give thanks to brothers who work unbelievably effed up jobs to secure the needs of their families, especially the ones who thought about running but couldn't. Give thanks to brothers who cook and clean and change diapers without fear their dicks falling off. Give thanks to brothers who take care of their children. Give thanks for brothers who are actively involved in the development of their children, who know their children's highs and lows, their likes and dislikes. Special thanks to the brothers who manage this irregardless of their relationships with the mothers. Give thanks to the brothers who save other brothers' harvests, who take the mother and therefore take the children, whether they are liked by them or not. These brothers don't come in masses, but there are enough of them to mention. Give thanks to the brothers who have no children, but who treat all children like they are all really ours. And instead of worrying them about the wind of fatherhood, we should be grateful for the love that they extend right now. Give thanks for brothers who love and respect their mothers, and therefore love and respect black womanhood. Give thanks to brothers who let a woman be herself without trying to mold her or shape her into a piss poor imitation of a white girl. Give thanks to brothers who like the women they sleep with and who don't sleep with women they don't like. Give thanks for the brothers who have taken the time and the care to patch up the injuries on the hearts of sisters who ran into the wrong man. Give thanks for brothers who let black women be their friends without trying to seduce them further on down the road. Give thanks to brothers who don't take advantage of women even when they know they can and pass up the opportunities to pimp no matter how available they might be. Give thanks to the brothers who have never, 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 never raised their hands against a woman and just let me back up and give more thanks on that. Give thanks to brothers who oppose rape first in their hearts and who defend black women without having to know them. I'm talking about those stalking moments when sisters ask unknown brothers to walk them or watch them to their cars and the average blood who gives her that coverage without a pause. Give thanks to the brothers who resisted and do resist enslavement through drugs and for the lesser heroes. Give thanks also for those who are enslaved but yet warn others about the wicked possibilities. Give thanks for brothers who love other brothers without fear of freakiness. Give thanks to brothers who tell the police nothing. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow too. Divine thanks to all of those brothers who die and have died rather than betray black secrets. Give thanks to brothers who receive fame and yet remain beautifully true to the race and its image. Give thanks for the brothers who are self-employed and the inspiration they give us all as we struggle to be self-reliant. And give thanks everlasting to any and all black men who have paid the extravagant cost of being brothers no matter how, the, how high the bill. A thought, because I haven't, I haven't finished this poem yet, and it's probably going to take a little while, but um, Geronimo Pratt. I just had two, two thoughts about him. Do black men endure because they are black, or are they black men because they endure? Do political prisoners, when they die, do they automatically go to heaven? Because, I mean, they've already been in hell. <laughs> black women again talking about your treatment of black men do we allow black men to be as good and as wonderful as they can possibly be this is called murder tell me my sister have you committed murder lately have you swallowed poison, lost your mind, and kept a child from its father lately? Have you put yourself first by badmouthing someone whose touch you know you used to die for? Have you become hard and bitter and ugly because you felt compelled to murder the memory of a man whose love you couldn't keep? Have you murdered your son lately? Have you taken his future as a man and tied it to the railroad tracks because his father failed to love you back forever? Have you robbed your daughter of a positive a positive relationship with the first man she ever knew? Have you killed her desire to love a man by recounting war stories that still have you shell-shocked beyond belief? Have you murdered anyone lately? 
Have you drawn and courted anyone lately? Not because they couldn't pay child support, not because they left you for higher heights, not because they now whisper promises in a new ear, but because no one whispers anything in your ear. Have you kept a child away from his father lately? Not because the father was a junkie, a rapist, a child molester, a basher, a walking, talking horror, not because you not because he did something bad, but because you want to hurt him. Because you can't find any place to dispose of your pain. Have you put your child's life and future development in jeopardy? Because you can't get past your own pain. Have I got to ask you this again? Have you murdered anybody lately? Have you kept a black man away from his child? Where did that poem come from? I'm talking to a brother who's a vendor on the street. And he turns around and said, you a poet? I said, yeah. He said, why don't you write about, uh, uh, she won't let me see my kids. He said, I'll be sending the money and everything and taking the food and stuff. You need to write about stuff like that. So, okay. <laughs> okay. From my number one, this is for my old man. When I was born, my father was 15. Right. My old man was never old. He was only 15 years older than me. Yet the ways of all men jazz behind his eyes. I could sing for him, but I'm a woman now. And my song would probably sound like all the whinings of all the other women who wanted to be a part of him. To his face, I used to question his wild ways. And he would question my questions, fearing and knowing that I was the embodiment of his spirit, looking him right dead in his eye. How difficult it must have been for him to see himself more in his daughter than in all of his sons. When I was young, I would go digging into the night, trying to find him, needing his presence for balance and his smile for reassurance. Other men were offered to me as surrogate daddies, but as long as my father was alive, I mean, who needed them? And besides, I was a thick-rooted child, and no one seed but my father's could claim me as fruit. The man I knew his father caused me to go out wandering into the shadows, looking for men like him to treat me just like he treated women. White men kidnapped and caged him so many times that his gaping absence has left holes in my woman thing. Holes that I'm still trying to fill with poems and music and men who promise not to hurt me too much. As white people destroyed the means for black alternative livelihoods to survive, my father shrank into himself. All his hurts and all his ifs were violently jammed into his soul where no one was allowed to go, not prying women looking for an edge or needy children looking for guidance. The man I dubbed father wanted to know what was it that I was always trying to get out of him? Why was I so persistent about dialogue? Why I wouldn't just go away when dismissed? Why I was always testing him for tenderness? Why I wouldn't just stop needing his love so much and go on about my estrogen business? But I just kept resurfacing saying, I'm your daughter and you belong to me. I am your daughter and you do belong to me. He knew that, but I reminded him anyway. And when circumstances finally slowed his role to an imperceptible crawl, and he was forced to live at his mother's house, I loved knowing that the days of going to bars and pool halls and sad, fast women to leave messages for him were finally gone. And now I could find him, even if I wanted nothing greater than a hug. Once I knew that he was centralized, I demanded that he extend himself to me because I had spent most of my life trying to protect and defend the precious reality of our being father and daughter, and I felt that we were finally in a position where I could get some of that energy back. The man I called father once lived in hell without being reduced to ashes. He walked on two legs when only crawling was allowed, and for this, a greater man can hardly exist for me, for whether positive or negative, he was always a man of power, and as flesh of his flesh, I will always be the radiance generated by that power. When almost every woman has an idea of what she wants in a man, right? And um, when I think about what I want, I want a man like Malcolm. I want a man like Malcolm to love black people with me, to be able to discuss Carter Woodson under the covers with me. I want a man like Malcolm to argue with until I have to go back to the library to make sure I know what I'm talking about. I want a man like Malcolm so that when I feel this hurry and tub and urge coming on, I can go straight into action without having to worry about whether the person I sleep with has my back. I want a man like Malcolm to come home to after I've had a hard day of shaking the shit out of white people. I want a man like Malcolm to hold me the way he held us all tight against the chest as if our existence revolved around him. 
I want a man like Malcolm with a red hot spirit to fire me up into whatever form of steel my people need me to be. I want a man like Malcolm to love me with a fierceness that can be used to coat my backbone with an indelible substance that repels cowardice and selfishness. I want a man like Malcolm to grow with me into one incredibly sharp machete that slices away at the white cancer that consumes our race. I want a man like Malcolm to help me create a child so that in days of glory I can look at that child and say, you know what, you just like your father. I may have wanted it, but I didn't get it. <laughs> Reading out of The Prince of Kokomo. This is for Mamadi Nayasuma. Do you remember Mamadi? Oh, yeah. Yes. And this is Mr. 2000 Black finally gets his due. Every time I cry, my third eye fills with images of an immense hall shimmering in the purity of untainted sunlight. A space of reckoning for black magnificent soldiers, ethereal in its beauty, mystifying in its serenity. The hall of justice reaches back into our deepest, darkest ancestry. With a hot pepper preciseness I've never known, I hear djembe screaming out the seriousness of your presence. I see you gliding down that hallway, clinging to the bone, flanked by ancestors on both sides. Faces you've loved, studied, envied, praised, and never dreamt of seeing come rushing towards you, spilling over with unrestrained joy. I see Damu reaching out to help you. I see Damu reaching out to give you some dap, and Barnett anxiously slapping your back as your soulful strength proceeds, and you freeze because you can't believe that Mongo and Olatunji are rubbing dollars all over your face. Your elation becomes palpable when from out of the mist, Malcolm and Dr. Clark insist upon embracing you. Your knees buckle, but Amos Wilson catches you while Queen Mother Moore goes out to get you some water. While the life you just lived starts releasing you, I hear a host of angelic voices wailing in the background, but I can't decipher the words because it's not my journey. I feel the tumultuous stir as divine apparitions shift to make room for you. I hear the heartfelt crescendo of applause wrapping itself around you as the Africans you were once torn from recapture and salute you. But most of all, I hear the bursting of my own heart as it momentarily stumbles around in the Grand Canyon that your home going has created. I like to scream and howl and roll around on the ground, but I can't. I like to blame somebody or hire a lawyer to take fake to court, but I can't. I'd like to break down and act like I just don't understand, but I can't, because I know with all the spiritual clarity that I'm capable of that you did your work. And that's why you're in the top 20 of my league of extraordinary black men, the ultimate brother, the kind I wish that my own brothers had grown up to be, a walking, talking, and guzo saba. You lived at the highest level of each principle every day and twice during Kwanzaa. In guarding the sanctity of our unity, you've been a warrior supreme, a one-man anti-defamation league, rescuing our images again and again from black trash marketeers. The straightness of your walk has been a knight in the back of our enemies, the crown prince of collaboration. You jammed with everybody who could be played with and extending yourself to every black group committed to restoring our people to their traditional pomp and splendor. Your consistency has been the glue that seals us together. Loyal to the finest degree, what others readily pimped, you have notably protected. Your combined talents and strengths have been a feast used only to satisfy our cultural hunger. And in the daily tick-tock of your life, you've been the mirror of our identity, a living shrine to our divine purpose, a perfectly directed arrow towards our liberation. And no matter how history treats your biography, you got the warrior queen seal of approval from me. Wow. <laughs> And he's not the only one. There are heroes in our midst. Okay. What do they say? Um, familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah. It kind of does because those people that you see all the time doing great things all the time, you don't give them the title of greatness. You don't wear the lens of greatness when you're looking at them because you already know them as if that means less. Okay. But there are people like Mamadi walking around in our midst all the time. Some of them's names we know, some we don't. Brothers who consistently work without having to be seen, without having to be um, um, photographed, without having to be placed into history, okay? But there are people doing the work all the time. 
dog. Well, this is the only one, okay, dog. The white man says a dog is a man's best friend. And since only an unconscious black man will call himself a dog, an unconscious black man is a white man's best friend. <laughs> the black man is not a dog. How do we get to that? Okay, because if you're calling yourself a dog, you're immediately calling your mother a bitch. There's no way that you can make a separation there. No way. Okay, a dog, you're calling people who build pyramids dogs? You're calling people who once changed the flow of the Nile River dogs? Okay, what does a dog do besides lick itself? And then go lick other dogs, all right? A dog, this is what you call yourself? I don't know how we got to that one. I really don't. Usually I can find some logical, you know, some logical kind of trace that one, I haven't got the slightest idea what to do with it, okay? A dog, okay. This poem is for Paul Coates. Sorry he's not here to hear himself. But Paul Coates is the director of Black Classic Press and Black Classic Press has just been given access to um, Howard University Press's uh, entire, what, inventory, present and past, so um, I suspect that he would do some great things with that because he's a great person. This is a reason, this is a man for all reasons. This is Paul Coates. Born 300% black, 200% male, 100% panther. He's always claiming he can't dance when battling for the minds of our people is the only dance a warrior needs to know how to do. Born in the city of brotherly love, he learned to engage words the way gangsters use guns and hustlers use flattery and politicians use diplomacy. Paul Coates can talk the deaf into swearing that they hear them. And if he'd been Jesus, he would have talked Pontius Pilate into helping him down off the cross so he could introduce him to Huey Newton. Born with a penchant for loyalty, he is the ultimate friend of scorned women, the politically raped and the haven't got a chance. If you just got to walk down a blind alley, he's the man you want at your side. Like one of Dumas's characters brought back to life, once he pledges himself to you, not even death can keep him from watching your back. Born a lover of African thought and a connoisseur of femininity. His legendary appreciation of the black and the fine has garnered him a place in the Guinness Book of Records for his heart's ability to occupy two spaces at the same time while generously loving both. Born the patron saint of African children and fatherhood, he spread his love-filled essence by recreating himself seven times. And seven times the best of what he was rose to the surface, and with serious weaving and molding, seven children emerged with qualities that would big up the chest of any parent of any color anywhere. Born in the clan of the scroll keepers, the blood of scribes past flows studiously through his veins. His relationship to the written word is almost amorous, and the dissemination of those words is to him what removing brain tumors is to a surgeon. Born to be a man beyond the shadow of a doubt, he is an international treasure, a place you send your son when manhood eludes him, a place you send your daughter for protection, a place that you send your soldiers for training, a place you go yourself for cultural and spiritual nourishment. Born to be a guardian of the perfect black. No matter where he goes, there are no whispers of betrayals behind his back. And since our liberation flag has been in his hands, it has never touched the ground. His presence in our lives is one of the reasons why white supremacy has had to back up so many times and go around and around and around. This poem is... It has length to it, but, and it was uh, inspired by Margaret Walker. I wanted something that was just going to cover everything that I possibly could say to black men. Okay. This was done for us as a people, but when I went back and looked at it, once I made a, a couple of adjustments, this speaks to black men the way I really, really wanted to. And it's called For Margaret Walker and Her People. For the dimly lit faces, doing what no one records, notes, or says thank you. For the ordinary or unseemly, working the underpinnings of liberation like ants infamously building, consistent in their anonymity. 
You are the people that has always been about brothers. From the nameless who eked out a pinch of food for runaways, the blood-soaked who wouldn't squeal, to the impoverished who stole from themselves to finance the apocalyptic dreams of Nat, the sheet-burning visions of Gabriel, or Denmark Bessie's recipe for how to snatch a black soul back from white possession. In your daily obsession to stay alive, your anonymous efforts carried the race with more intensity and frequency than the one-time heroes that history loves so much to highlight. For the soldiers, the black soldiers, humping it from birth to death, just holding on, taking the insults, swallowing the venom that with finesse erodes a person's lifeline, false smile by false smile, just holding on, never seeming to gain ground but never giving up any either, holding firm to identity in the face of multi-million dollar deals that promise honorary whiteness and a plethora of trivialities that real people could never need except in a parallel universe. For the brothers who went to court to sport an afro, who called the, corporation, called the corporations to the carpet over braids and cornrows, who backed the American legal system up over dreadlocks, I can't promise you healthy pensions, stock options, or golden years full of abundance, but I do guarantee my unstoppable, incorruptible loyalty to the creation of a world replete with the splendor of nappy hair. For the uncounted brothers, the unnoticed, the unrecorded, for those who were the glue that moved us as we moved, never letting go, nails dug into blackness so deeply not even death could extract them. For you snatched from the villages unmissed, you trampled along the march unmourned, you shoved off the ships uncounted, you dying in the halls mute. For the millions, the snuffed out, silenced, censored millions, existing in time still not knowing where to go because the beacon you need to see by can only be lit by your descendants' remembrance. For the strange fruit never tasted. For the disappeared and never seen again. For the rape whose voices were stolen and preserved on wax by the rapists. For the disbelieved, swearing your stories up and down to people who hid their ears the moment they saw you coming. For the heads that kept to the sky when there was no human comfort whatsoever to sustain. In honor of your pain, I cauterized the enemy within, daring it ever to form again. For the dreamless, the hopeless, the barren, the abandoned. For all the black brothers that Lincoln and Clinton didn't free. For the sensitive turned addict. For the artistic turned outlaw. For the genius turned trickster. For the enchanting turned hoe. I grant you forever access to my inner doors. For the never had a clue, all those broken up shades of black and brown, warring against the invisible thing that kept cannibalizing them. For the unread, the uninformed, the mystery-filled lives, squashed by the mystery. The pathetically religious, the too educated to make sense. For the unconscious and their unconscious little ones. For those who fought unknowingly on the wrong side for all the right reasons. For the politically unevolved. For those who never knew that it was all about skin color. The bad feelings that they could not shake. The boulder that they could never get from under was all about skin color. For those who knew and lost their minds in the knowing. Isolated. Laughed at. Ignored for dwelling on accuracies the enemy could only refute with violence. For the black male teachers, severed from schools for not letting black youth stumble around in the darkness. For those who lost their jobs because they couldn't get the black out of their blood. For those who'd go blow for blow with the demons over the smallest slight. Those who were always a menace, always starting something, always pushing the limits of the reality they attempted to corral us in. For the brothers who refused to believe the hype, who wore blinders, they kept on dressing loud anyway, laughing hearty and dancing whenever the muscle and music squeezed them, kept on loving watermelon and scoffing on chicken, shrieking out the gospel like thorn birds, wringing all the joy you could out of every day, no matter how little of it you had for yourself. You never surrendered to the notion of there being anything better than being your black selves. Please allow me the honor of wiping clean the tracks of your tears. Please allow me the pleasure of serving your still exalted interests. Please drape me with your acceptance that it may be my armor and shield. Fire up the bevels of your memory and burn me a sword of Malcolm X caliber and I will spend the rest of my lifetimes obliterating your enemies until they are no more. When we see brothers, uh, on the street, it's so easy to to label people. I mean, I know it is because I do it. I know how easy it is, okay? But in our labeling, you have to leave room for a person's humanity. You have to leave room for a person's capacity for change. 
you know. So when we call somebody a crackhead, that's not all he was. He wasn't born a crackhead. His mother didn't push a crackhead out of her body, okay? That's one aspect of him, one aspect. We don't know what he could emerge to be. We don't know what he could grow to be, okay? Um, I have a poem about my cousin, my cousin Walter. Uh, my, my cousin was on heroin from the time he was 15 up until he was maybe 54 years old, okay? And, you know, everybody in the family was kind of used to thinking of him, that, oh, that's Walter, who's a junkie, okay? And nothing else, nothing else. But what never, nobody kind of thought about was that Walter was a soft junkie. He couldn't hurt a black person. How are you going to get a junkie and you can't hurt a black person? Where are you going to get your money from? How are you going to beat people up and take their money and stuff, right? So he had to find other things to do because these things were not really inside of him. Okay, Never raised his hand to a black woman. Supposed to be a junkie. Okay. Cousin Walter has been committing suicide for a quarter of a century. But the only thing that dies are the people he loves. To his children, he is an entity they've all found alternatives for. No one is tuned into him or the fact that one night he broke through his own high to stop the rape of a woman, viciousness of a rapist, and redeemed himself for at least 2,000 seasons. Wow. You don't know what a person is going to be or what a person can become. You know, so when we think of them in that that one aspect, we're cheating them, we're cheating ourselves because we're not even allowing ourselves to experience them in a better way, a way, a, way, a way that might even be helpful to us. And we're not giving them the best of what we could give them because we're too busy saying, well, that's a crackhead, well, that's a junkie, you know, and you shut down after you say that. Everything just closes down after that as if there was just no more, you know. So. I'm asking of myself as well as the rest of you. When we see brothers engaged in behaviors that we know are anti-life, okay, um, that hurt us as a community, still remember this. I know this is hard. Even in the midst of maybe the negativism that they chose to do, the one thing they didn't choose to do was die. They chose to live. And when you consider what white supremacy does to us, how it beats on us from the moment we get it. It beats on us before we even get here. It beats on us before we're even notions in our mother and father's minds, okay? When we come out of the womb, white supremacy is right there waiting, along with our parents, okay, to kill us and to get us up out of here or to damage us in any possible way. Now, you think about what this society puts on people, and then you see, especially in holiday time, holiday time this, this blows my mind, too that around Christmas holidays, I've seen a lot of brothers who are supposedly homeless breaking their neck to say Merry Christmas to you. You know what I mean? Or to say Happy New Year. And they are so serious with it. They are truly feeling it. They're not going home to Turkey. <laughs> they're not gonna be gifts for them. So it's like there's something inside of them that says yes to life, even when everything else is saying no. And that something is they're black men. That is an exalted something to me, okay? Right under deity, <laughs> that's where I put that. And if it's black women, if we can think about sons that way, well, number one, if we can make better choices as far as who are the fathers of our children, number one, okay? And if we can wait until we're actually adults to then have them, okay? then maybe we can offer our sons uh, a, a more even playing ground, you know, a better threshold to come in on so that they can be the wonderful things that they can be. I'm going to read this poem. Five with his pants all the way down here, okay? And his little meaningless dreadlocks and his little blunt in his back pocket. We don't know that he won't become an ace of Hillier if somebody doesn't tap him and point him in that direction. It's a possibility, okay? So when we get a little disgusted with having to say the same things to people over and over and over again because we're trying to say, say them anyway. Say them anyway. Brain is nothing but a computer. It's going in there, all right? At some point in time, if he's fortunate, 
He can pull that information back up and save his own life with it. Say it to them anyway. And don't be afraid to say it to them because they're our children. Okay, and we really shouldn't be afraid of our children. No. And we're not above slapping them upside the head either. Asa, more than being a mastermind, a husband, father, friend, more than being a teacher, historian, spiritual leader, and soldier, Asa was a black man who lived up to the height of that status. In the hollowed halls of Lily White Educational Site, he stomped around like the giant he was, leaving black footprints that pointed straight to Africa, the birthplace of all knowledge. They called him Asa, the destroyer of multicultural mythology. Asa, the terminator of ignorance personified. From his first breath to his last, he was our Mansa Musa, thrusting gold at impoverished minds, starving for a glimpse of their own immeasurable worth. In the motherland he was separated from before birth, he proved the melanin in the soul outweighs the melanin in the skin. People who never knew him consider him kin because the African in him vibrated on such an elevated frequency, they were compelled by a whole host of deities to welcome him back home. He was so black, they had to step back and wonder how many more like him was America holding hostage? In the timeless realm of African-centered wisdom, Asa was the decoder of mysteries, the imploder of falsified facts, an impeccable warrior, following a code of honor that few have heard about and even fewer strive to emulate. Because freeing minds is not a recipe for tenure, and straining to take change off brains will not put the pea in your portfolio. In the eternal battle of good versus evil, them versus us, he peeled our eyes away from the television screens and focused them on the elusive nature of our incarceration. He made us see and feel the ever-changing bars pressing against our humanity, and slowly and gently he removed our shackles, carefully mapped out an escape route, and using all his nomo, called upon the maroon and all of us to arm ourselves with consciousness, independence, and a sense of unity like nothing this planet has ever seen. In the spiritual facade of coming and going, he will never leave us, and we will never let him go. For all the lives he saved, let the libations pour like rivers. For the hours he gave, let him shape eternity into his own fashion. For the self-determination he inspired, let us all be the flames on the candles that he lit. Selflessly and ceaselessly, with all the love he could muster every black day of his black life. Asa was bad. We have black artists in our midst. Black artists can help us to beautify some of the most ugly things that we have to witness and some of the most ugly circumstances that we have to come through. Black art can transform anything we need it to transform to make it usable, functional, and wonderful. We have these people in our midst. We got some Michael Browns, Yuziki Nelson, we have um, Holly Garima, we have Kwabana Ampofo Anti, we have uh, Akili Ron Anderson. We have people who do incredible work and they live right in that community. You can go over their houses, you know, and see their artwork. And maybe you should, okay? This is called the Ode to Art. Wouldn't it be an astounding use of African ingenuity if we could pick up a mask or a statue, stare at it, meditate on it, and experience the exact same emotions that urged the artist to create it in the first place. And then we could exchange the art for a mirror, stare at it, meditate on it, and experience the exact same emotions that made God delight in our conception. How impossible it would be then for us not to adore ourselves. In the beginning there was art, and the world was art, and art said, let there be hands that live to obey us as we chant rhythms to pound gold into a dinkra, fingers that listen as we sing the blueprints of things to be. Let there be hearts that genuflect in colors, our magnificent mandates on sacred walls. Let there be voices that make butts shake in earthquake. Mouths devoted to blowing out healing tones into the spirits of broken life forms. Let there be legs to fly where only the wings of ancestors can take them. Limbs that suspend physics with their speed and grace till our messages are divined and codified. Let there be spirits that nervously twirled and ascended our requests. Souls that exist to serve our perpetual need for recreation. Mm -hmm. 
when Africa retrieves her legacy of self-determination, when she is truly and not neo-colonially free, so our art will be, no longer caged in the cold sterility of European museums that boast of their theft and make us pay to, you, to reunite with the manifestation of our own souls. When Africa rises this one last time and plants both feet eternally in the soil that is her own embodiment, when she finally stands ready to turn the tables on history in favor of her children who are now too ignorant to call her home, then all the handsome items of gossamer loveliness, the lavishly carved stools, the intoxicating and yet masterfully made staffs, the luxurious cloths woven from priestly wombs, the celestial inspired combs, and the breathtaking statues that were taken as criminally as their creators will all come home. Jumping with wooden legs from the shelves of the so-and-so collection, exquisite statues will follow the drums home. Leaping from walls that deny function, juju masks will hurl themselves towards the continent of their birth. Ceremonial wonders castrated by disbelief will again feel their power and hurry back to fulfill their purpose. Ritualistic figures meant for fertility, held hostage just for mockery, will answer the stirrings of their mojo and head for the motherland. When Africa picks up her crown and declares all her children to be free, so then her art will also be. Um, a tribute is something as simple as saying to, to a person, Acklin, I see you. Okay? I see you. I see you working it. I see you being a rung on a ladder for our people. I see you. I see you having given your life and turned your life over to educating us. I see you. Okay. I see you ready to go into seniorhood, you know, with nothing but laurels that come from your people and from how hard you try to educate us. I see you. Sometimes we have to say that to people. We have to learn to say it a lot more often. And it's okay to say it. it and pick it up trash off the street and, you know, ran over there so I could tell him thank you. Because it was a big deal, you know what I mean? Your mailman, your mailman comes out in all kinds of weather, okay, and delivers your mail. Say that. Dude, I see you. That person rallies up more energy. So whatever it was they were doing, they can do it harder and they can do it better. Right now, black men need to hear good things from us. We know about all that other stuff because we've talked about it a million times. I've written it a million times and I've voiced it a million times. But there are wonderful things that they're doing as well. They are choosing life. They are saying yes when everything is telling them to die. And I mean around the world. Okay? So each one of us can participate in this in some kind of way. You know, your fathers your uncles, your brothers. And even if you don't actually say it, you can change how you were looking at a person. You can even keep that to yourself, you know, where you might not have liked them and you might have been angry because they did this, this, and that to you. Forgive them. White supremacy makes us do some horrible things to give each other those minute-by-minute -minute tributes. White supremacy loses its power. It loses its guts, though. It loses. It loses. And before it's all over with, you know we're going to stomp it out anyway, okay? So I'm going to do one last piece. I think this is out of Never as Strangers. If you want to know how I feel about black men, just ask me. The first man I ever met was a big, gruff man and the master of polygamy. As my father's father, he laid claim to me when I was only six months old. And once I was nestled safely in his house, he let it be known to the world that I was never going back to my mother's people. And that was my first introduction into African manhood. My grandfather saved my life and lost his own. With his last breath, he blew me into the struggle, gave me his backbone, and dared me to ever give it up. The last 30, 40 years have been a tornado of events that tossed me around so passionately that the only reality that I could keep hold of has been my love for black men. So for all the doubters and simple-ass disbelievers, 
Let's get the record straight once and for all. The most consistent thing in my life has been my love for black men. And if I had a dollar for every heartache I've suffered from a brother, I could buy America and give it back to the Indians. And tomorrow, if my new love throws me away, I'll come back into myself, take a break, clean off, pray that I can understand and forgive, and then move on to my new man. And if that doesn't work, then I'll move on to the next man because I've got more than enough love to share. And even though in your anguish, black man, you wound me, mistreat me or abuse me, I will never let the behavior of some of you destroy my reverence for all of you. Because I've seen what black men can do. I'm hip to Imhotep and down with Chaka Zulu. And unless Nat Turner objected, I'd probably been his personal bodyguard. And if I had been around in Garvey's day, you can bet I would have gave Amy a run for her money. Because I've had the pleasure of beholding the black man's wonders. I can testify to Malcolm's manhood because it was so tight, so tight, that even air couldn't seep into it. George Jackson was invincible, that the steel in his nerves was stronger than the steel bars of his cell. And Mark Essex showed us that we needn't be terrified of white people because they too can be killed. And then Giac came along with his multi-incredible self to show us that discipline must be the key to any lock we want to open. And today we have Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark. We've got Haki, Richard King, Obenga, Mandela. With men like these, how can we talk about losing? And on a personal note, I've got a publisher named Paul who worries more about my soul than about my poems. I've got Imani who worries about whether I have food in the house. I've got Doc who worries about whether or not my new love is treating me all right. And all of these men belong to me. They are my fathers and brothers and lovers. And nothing anyone could ever do could make me stop loving black men. Because the black men I've known are the ones who built the pyramids. And they are actively changing and correcting history with every thought and deed. And I feel sorry for any sister who doesn't have men like these in her life because it's the few good ones that enable us to survive the negative ones. One straight walking, truth talking black man can absolve the negativism of 20 black men. And no matter how many more painful experiences I might have, no one black man will ever destroy my devotion to all black men. No combination of black men will ever make me turn my back on all men. So in the future, if anybody ever mentions my name to you and ask if you know anything about me, well, you can say straight from the heart, I don't know the sister too well, but the one thing I know about her is she loves herself some black men. <laughs> Thank you for coming out and for about two seconds, if you have any questions, I will dare to be honest. <laughs> This new book, I can even tell you this. This new book is called The Prince of Kokomo. Uh, I don't know whether you remember. I'm thinking that when we were younger, there was a song called Old Black Joe from Kokomo. All right, and so Kokomo became the derogative term that we could use to call uh, dark skinned boys. Okay, my brother looked like Wesley Snipes and they called him Kokomo all through his childhood, all through his teens, all through adulthood. Now, I never called him that, okay? But he internalized that and never said anything about it, and he waited until he was like maybe in his late 40s at our father's funeral to sit down at the table during the funeral and say, you know what, I hate it when y'all call me Kokomo. I hate it when people call me that, okay? So when he passed, I decided to elevate Kokomo and make him the prince of it, since it had been a part of his life for so long. Actually, Kokomo is a privately owned island in Jamaica, okay? And it's also a uh, city in Indianapolis, okay? But um, that's where the title for the book came, and I'm sorry I didn't think of it while he was here, but I know he got the message because he's probably sitting in the back right now. Okay. Thank you so much again, and um, let's love black men, okay? Let's love them, because they're leaving here too fast and too hard. Uh, Kokomo is also um, uh, a, a strong term part of the culture in New Orleans of the black Indians. Yes. It's a name, it's a song, and there's a Prince of Kokomo. Wow! Black Indians in New Orleans. 
positive. I mean, if you know that he's come out of it comes out of Jamaica, Haiti, and Cuba into New Orleans. It's very old. Okay. The culture. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the concept and the term, the name. Hmm. So that's that's where it is. Do we need a passport to go there? No, no, you don't have to. Yeah. So I just took the, the white faces out and put black faces in and wrote some little short stories about college. And then by the time I was 15, I think I got kind of lazy and decided a poem is shorter. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, would be, it would be easier if I did that and then I wouldn't have to write continuously for um, short stories. And by the time I was 16, uh, Vietnam was going on and um, they were sending black men to Vietnam and I was actually meeting girls in school who had little boyfriends who had been sent to Vietnam. So I was writing letters to their soldier boyfriends for a quarter. Okay. And then um, I heard Arthur Price up, do This Is My Beloved. Have you ever heard that? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that. Oh, yeah. White boy named Walter Bentley wrote the poetry. But when Arthur Price I put his finger on it, he turned that thing inside out. And all I could think of was, wow, I could do a poem and then I could put music to it. I ran and got myself a little tape recorder. <laughs> I uh, put, put my music on the stereo, pull a you know, tape recorder, I buy it, got my little microphone, and started taping myself, right? So I sent it to uh, a friend of mine that was on the radio. I didn't ask him to, he played it on the radio. He started playing it on the radio so much that somebody got in contact with him from New York, asked us to come to New York, and I'm what, 19? So we go up to New York to a record company and um, do a record, not having the slightest idea what we were doing, okay? I didn't have the slightest idea what I was doing. I did take it to a person I knew who was like a law student, right, who said, go ahead and sign it, it's okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I believed him, right? So I signed it, and then I also told myself, well, I'm going to learn this world because I'm going to jump in it, okay? I'm going to jump in it, and that's how I'm going to learn it. I had paid for that for a very, very long time. I did that when I was 20. I'm currently being bootlegged in Italy, England, and Australia. A friend that I know is Ethiopian told me he has a CD of me in all in Italian. I can't even, what, I, 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 can't, I can't even say hello in Italian, okay? So it's not like I, I did that, I actually did it. So somewhere somebody got all the albums, somebody else has made the, you know, the CDs, and somebody else is selling them. I met somebody selling my album for $45 a piece in a flea market. He didn't even know he was talking to me. You know, so um, some justice. I need some justice there. Okay. But even with this, this poem, um, being a strong black woman can get you killed. I was doing a program with Sony. They were celebrating uh, Black Music Month. Yeah. Sony uh, had Gil Scott. What's the brother? Sundiata? Sekou. Sekou Sundiata. Yeah, um, uh, Nikki Giovanni. We all did this one program. Somebody lifted my poem from the program, hmm. changed the, the last two lines. That thing was emailed around the world before the book even came out. A play has been done out of my poem. Okay. And people say, well, did you have a copyright? Like that means something to somebody. They bank on you never finding out, number one. And then if you find out, they bank on you not having the money to keep pushing to do something about it, you know, to actually stay in the courts and deal with it. But um, at some point, I pray to do just that, to deal with it, you know, so... That's my background. Now there are four books, two albums, and they even put an album out of the stuff I threw away. See, this is how naive I was. I didn't know what, what I called the trash can was the trash can. What white people call the trash can was something they go back into when you turn your back and then, you know, use it and make a whole new work. They did a whole album off of stuff I threw in the trash and I didn't even know it was on the street and it was in stores. And somebody called me up on the phone and told me about it. 
you know. So I work for us. Okay, I work for us. I found you a very, very first book of poetry when I went into a used bookstore, as I used to do, to find books about our people and mm -hmm. give them away to students. And it knocked me to my knees. Is that book still available? Is that book of poetry? Is it the little white one? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Please say it is, please. please. <laughs> I didn't want to redo that. Oh. I only because we're not always working with so much money, so it was like I didn't want to take money and spend it on that when I know I have at least two uh, books worth of poetry at home that no one has ever seen, you know, and that I've never read. You know, um, Paul might have one copy. I'll ask him. He might have one. I have one too. If I can find it in my Music Africa library room. Okay. But I'll pay a premium price for it. I will sell many soda bottles to get that again. Oh, well, don't say that to me, brother, because I'll, I'll run in the bathroom and whip the book up real quick and come right back out again. <laughs> we can talk. We can talk. We can talk. Okay. You can contact okay. Anything else? I, I have a problem that's bothering me. Um, we talk about black men. Mm -hmm. We talk with a certain kind of dualism. Sometimes we talk about black men as African American men. And then sometimes we talk about black men in the African universe, in the Pan African universe, without separating them or understanding who they are. We take them for granted as one person. Except that we don't include men from Papua New Guinea and Borneo and these places in the Pacific that are black men and their lives because we know very little of them, about them. So we don't include those kinds of people. Uh, we don't include indigenous black men in the Amazon and in, in, in Peru and these places because we don't know anything about them. So that therefore we focus essentially on talking about African American men, uh, African men and, and Caribbean men because those are the people that we interact with, all right? And particularly now, those who live in Paris and London and New York, these urban men that have certain attitudes that have nothing to do with our indigeneity, our sense of self. And we call on them as being black. You see what I'm saying? They have nothing to do with our indigeneity. They are men who live in urban societies with a lifestyle that they had nothing to do with being black. Just shades of blackness. Sure. All right? Okay, now. Having had that problem and, and trying to work that out in my head, I then asked myself, can we, in the global matrix, with globalization, can we raise black men or even become black men within the framework of this, whether we're in Africa, the Caribbean, or the United States, within this framework of globalization, technology, success, and war. Because in this world, we are raised, whether it be me, whether it be Obama, whether it be Duke Ellington, I don't give a damn who it is. We are raised to, be, to engage through, through religion and philosophy to be men of fear and men of violence. Nothing else. Nothing else from the time we're small, we are raised. Her children, my children, my sons, all of us sons are raised to be violent and to, in, to endure and enjoy looking at violence, whether it is movies, television, comic books, etc. And at the same time, to build a certain fear with the lack of confidence in oneself or one's people self. So we are terrorized by that which has been passed on to us by white supremacy, in which we are permanently seeking to be white men rather than the black men that you are searching for to love on a permanent basis. Unless I specify an area, talk about all of them. 
But also what I don't say is I'm talking about all of them who choose also to be black. Because that is who I'm talking about. I'm sorry that I can't speak for brothers who are gone. You know, so far in the white world, they can't possibly ever come back. I'm not talking about them. They're gone. I'm talking about men who choose to be what they are. They know that they're black in that ancient black African kind of way. Who know that. Even if they don't know a whole lot about it. But know it as something that they can feel inside of themselves. And something that they know they have to hold on to. Because that's the thing that keeps them alive. That's the thing that gives them their fight. That's the thing that white supremacy hates the most about them and is trying to stomp out. So when I'm talking about loving black, that's what I'm talking about. And those men who, sim who are black and simply want to be good people. Okay? That's, that's where I am on that. But I do understand what you're saying and I do agree. Except the journey these extended 18 or 21 years have been so conditioned by propaganda, by religion, by philosophy and ideology that we have not been able to escape the virus, the disease, or whatever it is that says you are who you are regardless of what you claim. And because we have people like Nana Kwabana Brown, yes, yes. Maladona Somme, right. yes. Dr. Fukia, yes. these are people who when it, who keep us from going crazy, I okay, <laughs> going white, <laughs> all the way, just losing ourselves totally and completely, you know, to whiteness or white definitions, okay? These are people who, when we need to be rehued, re-blackened, re-spiritualized, that we can go to and they can give us an example, okay, of what we need to do and what we need to follow so that we won't be what you, which, which you just talked about. But my last a Catholic school, and to be molested in a Catholic school, has now fit in to the contemporary matrix of, of, of the 21st century in which one's sexuality is the defining purpose or the defining identity of one's presence. You have to watch Maladoma. All right, I know that. I'm serious because depending upon the crowd of people he's dealing with, yeah. he changes. Well, uh, well uh, then that's okay. being chameleon. And I, yes, and I've seen uh, him in a situation where he was so uh, hmm, uh, about uh, black, about African spirituality yeah, yeah. and about black men being black that he cried. I mean, he right. just. Okay. And yet I've seen him some other times. I've, read all this work. I've, I've seen, seen him some other times once. when yes. he flaky. He was yeah. He was uh, soft. Okay. Yeah, all he right. was soft. So, I'll end it. Greetings, Black Queen. I just want to congratulate you. You're speaking out to the spirit and the hurt of our black men, and thank God for you paying tribute to them. I so often think about Brother Hadari, who just passed and made his transition. And my sister, my, my sister Nubi here, she and I can attest that we would just work at the store, and sometimes we wouldn't get paid right away when it was payday, but then we knew how you. You will push money to different budgets and just some different orbits. But by me listening to you, beloved, I keep thinking about when you were talking about your father being 15 and you being four, and you're still doing the work now as of today. So how does it relish in terms of the economic spirit uh, of 2011? And can we really get back with uh, people such as Gil Scott, Aaron, and just stay on that straight path? because? A lot of times they are young men with their pants down and you don't know which one is a good one and which one is a bad one. You know, but by listening to your poems, they were all so personalized. So that was my question to you in retrospect. Okay, that was a great big fat question. Yeah. Economics. I think we have to deal with all things the same way, okay. to tell you the truth. I think that We have to deal with our spirituality more than anything, okay? Once we get the spirituality in place the way it's supposed to, I don't think economics are going to be so much of a problem. I don't think academics or education will be so much of a problem. It will inform us what to do. It will open doors for us to do those other things, okay? And 
What I said about, sometimes when we really know what the problems are, they seem so grand and they're so big, you know, and we want to do something so badly that we become paralyzed because we want to take care of the whole thing or fix the whole thing all at once. You do the small things. You do the little teeny weeny things. You could have a susu just of a couple of you and your boys. You know what I'm saying? People that you might play ball with or something. Okay, you can start some uh, collective economics just with them in your own way. And once that works, take it a little further, make it a little broader, include a little more. We have to not be afraid to work from the small places. Okay, that's a good thing to do. And do it step by step, carefully, slowly, so we won't have to go back, you know, and fix it later on, you know. And like I said, once we start to really, really, really take care of ourselves in a spiritual way, I believe the doors will open up for all those other things. Answers will come for all those other things. The one major thing we have to me is a spiritual problem. It's hard for, I mean, it's terrible for a, a, for a, a, a man not to know he's a deity. You know, it's hard to be, what this, you say it's hard out here for a pimp, it's hard out here for a God. Right. <laughs> yeah. For a black man to walk around, you know, for somebody that exalted to have to walk around in this mess. You know what I'm saying? So I think we're going we, we gonna to do it. We're going to do it. Okay. Might not be by this evening. <laughs> but we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done because we want to. <coughs> we really, really want to. So. Anything else? Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you for letting me do this because I really needed to just say, if I... It's hard enough for a man to walk around unexalted, but just think of how hard it is for a deity. Did I get that right? I said it so fast, I, I don't think I can say it again. Okay, we got it on tape. I know we said it was hard out here for a pimp, and I'm saying it's hard out here for a deity, for a God. That's right. Mm. That's right. So our poet sister, uh, Lani Mataka. <laughs> and what, would, what would we do without our spiritual uh, doctors? Mm. I don't know. I mean, that smallness go back for the next day and the next day and the next day. And so um, she is, a, I have to say one thing too, just to note. I am one person that got the email with her um, adjusted poem, It's Hard Being a, black, uh, a Strong Black Woman. And uh, I was so angry about it. And it was sent by a sister to a sister about sisters. Mm -hmm. And I shot an email back just as fast as I could finish that, reading it, saying, uh, what did I say? I said that you were copy. I said something like, um, being a strong black woman can get you killed. I said, well, being a poverty woman can get you killed. <laughs> because it's true. You, we don't realize how much damage. Who's using this poem? We are. We're the ones using this poetry. Why people don't use this poetry for, in, in terms of consumption? Maybe, yeah, the producers. But consumption is us. So if we don't think twice about what we're using and the artists, the impact on the artists, and what is for the people, what's the point? So I, I got all kinds of emails back that was explained to me, well, I'm an elder and I should be more careful with the sisters. I didn't read them because I knew what they were going to say. I knew that. But at the same time, sometimes you have to take a very hard line. You just have to let the ax fall and let people scramble where they will and take the message the way they can. Um, but in that light, on that note, I'm uh, very glad to have her with us and the book here with us and her latest book, the Prince of Kokomo. Um, we, are you going to sign for us now? Sure. Yay. So we're going to bring you a little share, and please, uh, the books will be available at the counter, and Lainey is here for you. Thank you again. Okay.